Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great honor that we present to you Les Brown. It's not over until I win. Repeat after me, please. It's possible. I can live my dream. It's necessary. I work on myself. Surround myself with winners. Become creative. It's me. I've got to make it happen. It's not over until I win. The next thing that's important to know, yes, it's possible that you can choose your future and direct the course of your life as you run toward your dream. It's necessary that you have goals, that you write those goals down, that you plan, that you think constantly of how you can begin to improve what it is that you're doing. If it's your presentations, if it's your recruiting skills, whatever that is, it's also necessary that you look for ways to always find a way to pull it out when everybody else thinks that you are defeated, that you've got to take personal responsibility to know that in order to become successful, you've got to make it your personal business to do it. But the next thing, ladies and gentlemen, I want to share with you that some of you already know that it's hard. It's not easy. It's hard changing your life. It was hard when just over three years ago, in the Penobscot building in Detroit, Michigan, where I was operating my business. And I fell on some hard times. And I was sleeping in my office. It was hard coming into the lobby. And the security said, excuse me, Mr. Brown, can we see you for a moment? And I said, yes. And I walked up to the counter, and he gave me an envelope. And he said, would you mind reading it here? And I opened the envelope, and the envelope was from management that said, this is an office tower. It's not a hotel. Please do not sleep in your office. And I said, excuse me, sir. I said, I just work long hours in creating my business. I'm an entrepreneur. And right now, things are bad for me. But they're not going to be this way always. And I just asked for the opportunity to continue to operate like I'm doing. I'm not trying to make this my home. And it was hard coming through the lobby. And sometimes they would laugh. There's a guy talking about becoming successful. And look at him. He's bathing in the bathroom upstairs on the 21st floor. He sleeps on the floor. Him and two other dreamers up there. Look at him. It was hard, ladies and gentlemen, coming to speak to people. And I was facing financial difficulties in my own life. I was behind on my bills and my dreams, and I'm saying to them, you can live your dream. It was hard, ladies and gentlemen. It was very difficult to pick myself up each day believing that I could do it. There were times that I doubted myself. I said, God, why, why is this happening to me? I'm just trying to take care of my children and my mother. I'm not trying to steal or rob from anybody. Why did this have to happen to me? It was very hard. And here's what I want to say to you. For those of you that have experienced some hardships, don't give up on your dream. No one could have convinced me by holding on, by continuing to push forward, by continuing to run toward my dream, that one day I would have my own talk show. It's a long shot, ladies and gentlemen, from Liberty City, an abandoned building on a floor never knowing my mother or father. It's a long shot being here with you today in this dome in Atlanta. It's a long shot. No college training, labeled, educable, mentally retarded. But I kept running toward my dream. Don't stop. Don't stop.
working towards your dream. It's very important as you hold on to that dream. There are moments when you're going to doubt yourself. There are rough times are going to come, but they have not come to stay. They have come to pass. It's very important for you to know that. Don't say I'm having a bad day. Say I'm having a character building day. It's very important for you to believe that you are the one to make this happen. I remember this high school teacher, Mr. Leroy Washington, at the end of school one June, it was just a few days before we were supposed to leave. And I just got my report card. And it indicated that I'd fail history and I'd fail English. And I would have to go to summer school. And I was feeling within myself that I was a failure, that I, I'm slower than most people in, in getting paperwork. And, and I was feeling down on myself and, and, and very negative. And Mr. Washington was giving a speech to the graduating seniors, and I was in 11th grade. And even though I wasn't supposed to be in there, I went in there because the speech he was giving, that speech was for me. And as he talked, my heart began to beat fast. Tears began to run by my eyes, and, and I was in the back just listening to him because he said, and he was a very dramatic man. I still talk to him to this day. He said, as graduating seniors of Booker T. Washington High School, I want you to know that you are blessed and highly favored, and that as you go toward the future, begin to know that you have greatness within you. And if just one of you here begin to envision yourselves as being blessed and highly favored to reach your goals, if just one of you capture the essence of what that means, that you have greatness within you and a responsibility to manifest that greatness, that you can make your parents proud, you can make your school proud, you can touch millions of people's lives, and the world will never be the same again because you came this way. And the students gave him a rousing standing ovation. And as he left the auditorium, I ran down the steps and I caught him in the parking lot. I said, Mr. Washington, he said, yes. I said, do you remember me, sir? He said, no. I said, uh, my name is Leslie Brown. My mother, she works in the cafeteria here. I'm one of the twins, Leslie and Wesley. I said, Mr. Washington, but you know, you know, I got these big dreams. You know, I like talking to people. I love people. I said, I, I want to work with people. And I got this dream of buying my mama a home. Could, could I do that, Mr. Washington? He said, it's possible, Mr. Brown. And as he walked away, I called him again. I said, Mr. Washington? He said, what do you want now? I said, um, I'm the one, sir. I said, I'm the one. You, you remember me, sir. I'm Miss Mamie Brown's boy. I'm the one. I'm the one. And you must feel that, that that's why you're here, because you are the one. And I remember when PBS first played one of my specials called You Deserve, one Sunday afternoon in Miami, Florida. I had some friends call him to tell him to tune in. And he watched the program. He called me in Detroit, and I answered the phone. I said, hello. He said, may I speak to Les Brown, please? I said, who's calling? He said, you know who this is. I said, oh, Mr. Washington, it's you. He said, you were the one, weren't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, and you were so crazy. I said, I know, but I'm rich now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 
It's not going to be easy. It was hard laying on the floor of the Penobscot building, looking out of the window, daydreaming, saying, Les, can you do this? Can you make this happen? I used to listen to tapes day in and day out about See You at the Top, my, my great friend Zig and, and, and Dennis Waitley and different other motivational speakers and Dr. Norman Vincent Peale and Dexter saying, don't let nobody steal your dream. I used to ask myself, can I do this? And something said within me, you're the one. You're the one. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. While you're here, and before you go back home to your respective cities and communities, write down at least five reasons on why you deserve your dream, on why you won't give up, what's going to make you unstoppable, why you must be unreasonable, because logical, practical thinking says you can't do it today. But if you want to produce unreasonable results in your life, like living your dream and taking charge of your destiny, you've got to be an unreasonable person. You've got to be an uncommon person. So write down the reasons of why you're here. My first major goal was to buy my mother a home. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, what, what will reasons do, Les? Nietzsche said, if you know the why for doing, you can endure almost anyhow. What do you mean by that? If you know why you're doing something, when the hard times come and they're going to come, when the disappointments and the rejections come and they're going to come by the truckloads, your reasons will be your rod and staff to comfort you, to pick you up. Once again, I got a saying on one of my tapes, if life knocks you down, try and land on your back, because if you can look up, you can get up. Let your reasons get you back up. I remember when I, I bought the home for my mother and she came out of the car. When I opened the door, I said, Mom, I think I know these people in this house. That was my first major goal. And then I couldn't conceal it anymore. I said, Mom, I got this for you. And as she went from room to room, looking at the house and saying, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. No one ever could have convinced me that this could have happened to me. And she looked at me and she said, Leslie, and you cost me so much problems as a boy, you were always in the stuff. She said, no one could have convinced me that day when I walked in that house and this lady was holding you and your brother. And she said, ma'am, I want you to promise me two things. And she said, what is it? She says, one, promise me that you won't separate them. She said, I want them raised together. I want them to know each other. I got pregnant while my husband was away in the war and I can't keep them. Promise me that you won't separate them. She said, I promise I won't. I've never had children. I promise I won't separate them. And she said, promise me that you'll never tell them about who I am because if my husband ever found out, he would kill me. She said, I promise. And she said that she gave them to us and, and she kind of cried and she, and she was walking out the door and she looked at my adopted mother. She said, remember, don't you separate them. She said, I swear to God, I won't. I won't separate them. I'll keep them together. And she said, as I held y'all in my arms, I never had any children of my own. I didn't know how I was going to do it. But I knew with the help of God, I will do it. And ladies and gentlemen, my mother had a dream of having children and raising us. She didn't know how she was going to do it. You're going to be just like that. And some of you are already there. Well, you don't know how you're going to make this happen, but you just feel within yourself some way, somehow, with the help of God, I'm going to make it happen. Repeat after me, please. No matter how bad it is, or how bad it gets, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it.